Well, praise the Lord and good day to you and welcome to Cross Time with Pastor Curtis. I'm Pastor Curtis Hutchinson here in the studio at Crossway Church and so glad to be with you gathered around God's Word today. We're going to be studying in 1 Peter chapter 2 on this 28th day of October in 2022. And so go ahead and grab your Bibles, and while you're grabbing your Bibles and getting you a piece of paper to write on and a pencil, I'll just let you know that you can watch these broadcasts live on the Pastor Curtis Facebook page. You can also watch them later uploaded to the Curtis Hutchinson 316 YouTube channel, and they're also on the website, thecrosswaychurch.com. Uh, Our church has a church app. You can get on your smartphone. It's Crossway Church. Uh, There's a Spreaker app. You can get on your smartphone, and it's it's, uh, exclusively audio, not video, but audio. It's the Spreaker app, and we have over a 1,000 preaching, teaching sessions on there available to you at any time. You just click on the... Uh, uh, the Spreaker app, and our channel on Spreaker is for those who have ears to hear. Or you can simply type my name, Curtis Hutchinson, in there, and it'll bring you up to a, 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 a just a, a, a load of cross-centered teaching, preaching sessions that you will be blessed uh, through. And I know the Lord will encourage you and turn the light on even brighter as you listen to those ministers in these last few moments of this church age who the Lord is raising up to literally uh, walk in a place of being determined to know nothing other than Christ and Him crucified and to see every jot and tittle not only because of the blood, but through the blood, so that it can be applied and the church can be awakened unto righteousness and we can go forward in this great truth of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and what he did for us on Calvary's cross. I'm thankful again uh, to be here every Friday morning at 9 a.m. Central Time with you gathered around God's Word And uh, he's going to show us great, great things today. When we come to a Bible study, we come to find Christ. We come to gain Christ. We come that we might walk away with a greater light than we had before, with a greater knowledge of Christ, trust in Christ, dependence upon Christ, and a realization that what he did at Calvary is what allows him to be all that he desires to be and all that he desires to do in us, for us, to us, and through us. Hallelujah. So, again, 1 Peter chapter 2. This is part 1 of this great second chapter. So, here we go. We won't get very far today, and that'll be proven with the very first word when the Bible says, Wherefore, just a a little quick lesson on on these sort of things. In the Bible, when you see therefore or wherefore, you have to go there or you have to look there. You have to look somewhere because what it really means, wherefore and therefore, you have to see there or look somewhere to go forward. Where? Then forward. So wherefore, the Bible says, laying aside all malice, not a little bit, all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speaking. Sounds like we've got a a full-time job on our hand. But that first word, wherefore, points us back to somewhere. So let's go back to the end of the first chapter and read from verses 23 to 25 because, I mean, really it's the entire first chapter, the first portion of the letter, but we'll just close out chapter 1 so we can get a glimpse somewhere so we can go forward. Where? Oh, forward. Okay, now we we look somewhere, 
then we okay now we can go forward so this proves that we can't just read we've got to study we've got to load the wagons with the what the holy spirit's trying to give us he's he's trying to load the wagons with somewhere we've already had our feet planted our eyes have already beheld and he's been allowed to to put the words into our hearts then we go forward not leaving behind anything. I like to call it loading the wagons. We, we're taking everything with us that we get because we're taking the cross with us moment by moment. We deny ourselves moment by moment. You say, well, nobody's doing that. But there is a people of God that desire to live for God, to please God, to be walking in the place with him in the light he walks in moment by moment. And how that's done is a striving for the faith of God the gospel that nobody you're right nobody is living for the lord every moment of their life and those that say they are well they uh, well there still is the residue of the sin nature that's deceitfully deceiving them we make bad decisions we blurt out things we some of these things we'll go over in the first portion of chapter 2 we're all guilty of and people that say they're not well add lying to the list because yes we are and because there's that residue of the presence of sin that still lingers on. The old man's crucified, the affections and the lust have been crucified, but that don't mean you don't still have some sometimes. Galatians 5 says it's a war between the spirit and the flesh. So we, we know that, 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 that we're striving for this moment by moment experience of our Lord in the light that he walks in, in the victory he's afforded us. So let's go back and read verses 23 through 25 of 1 Peter chapter 1, and this is where we'll look so we could go forward. So being born again, not of corruptible seed, but, in, but of incorruptible seed seed by the word of God and we're talking here about Jesus the living word of God the word that came from heaven hallelujah the Bible says in Revelation 19 that when he comes and we come with him he'll be riding on a white horse wearing a vesture dipped in blood and his name is the word of God Jesus Christ is the living word of God and it says here which lives and abides forever. For all flesh is as grass. All flesh is like the grass. All men are like the grass. And all the glory of man as the flower of grass. Whatever we got that we're known of, whatever glory we think we got here in this world, watch the grass withers and the flower falls away. You didn't come into this world with anything. You're not taking anything of this world out when you leave. The only thing you can take out of this world when you leave is, and it's not the world that gave you what you take, it's that you're not even taking faith with you. We've heard that all our life. When, when I go, I'm not taking nothing but faith. No, you're not taking faith with you because where you're going, faith's not needed. All you're taking is the fruit of the works Christ has been able to do in you and through you. Hallelujah. That's all you're taking. The love of God in your heart and the fruit of all he's been able to do in you and through you as you've allowed him in those moments to rule over you as your king. Hallelujah. So, Verse, verse 25, but the word of the Lord endures forever. This is our Jesus. The word of the Lord endures forever. The living word of God endures forever. And this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. 
This, 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 this proves that from Genesis to Revelation, we live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Jesus said that in Matthew 4 and 4. We don't live by bread alone. That's flat. That's, that's, that's uh, causing our flesh to live, but we just read the flesh. It's going away. Hallelujah. Thank God. But we live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, not every word in the Bible has proceeded out of the mouth of God. Some of the words we see in our Bible proceeded out of the mouth of Satan. Some uh, proceeded out of other men and evil things. But God deemed it necessary to put it in the canon of Scripture right there alongside his words so that we could see all that we can see in the word of God. But we live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God as we hear God speaking to us today from heaven. Hallelujah. So uh, this is... The word of the Lord endures forever, and this is the word by which the gospel is preached to you. By the word that lives forever. The word of God, the living word of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the gospel unto us. So then, chapter 2, wherefore, because of that, now we can see the necessity of, to go forward. And this is what we'll be found doing if we remember where our faith has to be anchored in Christ and Him crucified because everything else pertains to the flesh. Mm. Everything other than Christ and what He did in His flesh to overcome all of our weakly, sinful, fleshly attempts to serve God in and of our own selves, uh, he overcame all that at Calvary. And our faith is either anchored there or whatever else we're pointing to is really self. We need to always know that. Purpose-driven life is about self, what I can do. The government of 12 is about what I'm going to go do. Everything other than Calvary is self-centered, self-focused. The cross is the only thing God has done and opened the door for us, for us to see self removed and Christ glorified, ruling and reigning over us. And every moment that we're every moment that we're not trusting in the sacrifice of Christ, in those moments, my friend, we are trusting in ourself. We are appeasing our sinful flesh. It, it, every moment that we're not trusting in Christ and his death and through faith experiencing the, 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 the benefits of our union with him in his death is self-centered, it's self-focused, it's self aggressive and, and now now the devil's smart at what he does he paints it up and puts different names on it and tells us well God can use these things to, no no God uses the gospel and the spirit of God only works within the perimeters of one's faith in the gospel which is the death of Jesus that's exactly right so every moment that we're not trusting in Christ and his death on the cross we're, we're, we're just, we're in the flesh. We're trusting in the flesh. And someone might say, well, you don't have to always be thinking about the cross. My friend, only the fleshly, carnal, egotistical, prideful, selfish behaviors of the old man would scream those words. If God's been thinking about the cross of Christ for all eternity, because that is what it means for the lamb to have been slain before the foundation of the world, that doesn't mean at some point before. That means it's always been that way in the mind of God. That's always been in the mind of God as long as God's been God, and that's forever. So how often should our minds be given to the great redemptive plan of God? 
How often should our minds be there? Because here's what happens we're, when we're not trusting in Christ and Him crucified, when we're not learning to become determined to know nothing other than that, then these things we read in verse 1, how, how, do, you think, how do you think we can do a big boatload of stupid malice? When, when do we do that? When, when, is it that we, when is it that we do a big boatload of guile? When is it that we, as Peter did, you read about in Galatians 2, step into a, a sinking ship of dissimulation, which is hypocrisy? When, when do these things happen? When we're not focused, when we're not trusting. Because here's a factual statement, my friend. Now, you might not have ever heard this, or maybe you have. But at the same time, your heart is melted before the Lord and you're trusting in the death of Jesus on Calvary's cross and your union in his death. See, it can't just be that you, you're trusting and that he saved you from hell and, and the guilt of your sins because that's your position. But for your daily condition, your walk with him moment by moment, you've got to know something. You've got to know how to, how to experience that position that you've had your faith in for you. You've got to understand you got to understand, you got to fight to keep your faith there every moment because it's in those moments you're not trusting in Jesus and what he did at Calvary that we see malice and guile and hypocrisies and envies and jealousies and these evil backbiting speakings. Yes, my friend, that you and I find ourselves involved in when we're caught off guard. You see, the reality is I can say all day long, well, of course I believe in the cross of Christ. Of course I do. And at the same time, be found entangled in all these things. But the reality is, and I've used this phrase over the last two or three months, that blanket statement of just knowing your position. Well, of course I believe in Christ. Well, of course I believe in the cross. We believe in the cross. But while you're trusting in the cross, you're not committing malice. You say, give me scripture. Okay. The Bible says, Peter also wrote it. And it's in the second letter he wrote. But it's that while you are making your calling and election sure, that means while you're trusting in that actual event that God elected you, he called you and elected you through, which was the very grace of God Jesus tasted death by, while you are making that sure in your experience, the Bible says that you won't even stumble. See how good that is? That's a promise, my friend. So yeah, while we say, well, of course I believe in the cross, but are you trusting in that? Because while you are from the heart trusting in Christ and his sacrificial death, you're not going to be committing malice. Now, the moment you look away, the opportunity will be there for malice, for guile, for hypocrisies, for envies, and all evil speaking. See, this is a move of God where, in, oh, yes, the message of the cross. Thank God for all the theology of it we've learned for years. But what God is doing is attempting to get his people to live the crucified life, to deny themselves not when they get up in the morning and go, then just throw that out and go about their way. Let me tell you something. If I'm denying myself, taking up my cross moment by moment, 
You're talking about, this is where the good fight of faith comes in. You're talking about a fight. Of, Christians don't know anything about a fight of faith because they got a little devotion in the morning and they think that's just got them covered the rest of the day. My friend, what you do right now, two hours from now, you, you could find yourself in a boatload of guile and hypocrisies and malice and all sort of things. And where do you think all these, James wrote, where do you think all these, these backbitings and wars come? from within us because we're not carrying the cross. We're, we're not taking up the cross. We're listening to preachers who say you ain't got to talk about the cross all the time. I'm, listen, I'm running from them folk. I'm, I'm headed out toward where I can hear it all the time. I can listen to the Holy Spirit. The Bible says the Holy Spirit turns us over, delivers us unto death always. Think about that, my friends. If the Holy Spirit only works within the perimeters of one's faith in the sacrifice of Christ, where is it do you think he's pointing you to always? Always. Always. First, uh, 2 Corinthians 4.11. Always. There's never a moment the Holy Spirit's not pointing you, delivering you, unto the death of Jesus because if he delivers you anywhere else, life can't come out of nowhere else. Unless he can get you focused on the sacrifice, he can't even write the words of God, the new covenant, in your heart because he writes it through the blood. He writes it through faith in the blood. He does what he does within the law that he's been Given to function in. The Holy Spirit is God. You can't put God in a box, they say. I agree. But God has confined himself and he won't deviate from it. This law of the new covenant, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Romans 8, 2. All Christians are in Christ Jesus because they've been immersed into his death. Romans 6, 3. And Colossians 2 and 6 tells us, As you have received the Lord Jesus Christ, therefore walk ye in him. And th this is what I'm talking about. Walking in him is a step by step, moment by moment. It's not 30 minutes in the morning, then the rest of the day I'm on my own. It's not Sunday morning church, then the rest of the week I'm on my own. No, it's moment by moment. It's learning to fight the good fight of faith. How often? Not just when you're hit with news about moment by moment. If you're carrying the cross, my friend, when the news comes, you've got what you need to go right through it. If you're waiting to take Take the crop, man, goodness, you, we don't wait. It's moment by moment. Well, who's doing it? We're striving for the faith of the gospel, and the faith of the gospel is the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We, we walk by faith. We live by the faith of the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us, Galatians 2 and 20. So let's look at this this morning. Verse 1, wherefore laying aside all malice. You and I don't just decide we're going to lay aside malice. We don't read, well, okay, today I'm laying aside malice and guile, hypocrisies, envies, and all speakings. You and I don't lay aside anything if we're not taking up the cross. Taking up the cross, that means having faith in the death of Jesus, not with my lips, not with my head, but a surrender, my surrender to having died with Christ. That I'm hidden with him there. That I'm protected by him only through faith in what he did there. Hallelujah. So I can't lay aside anything unless I'm taking up something else because we're carrying something at all times. We're carrying a boatload of mess, excuse the phrase, it's what all these things are, uh, stuff that gets you in a mess. Or we're carrying the yoke of Christ, which is faith in his cross. I've said it in the last few weeks, many people come to Christ, but they don't take his yoke. 
Well, how do I know I've taken his yoke? Well, he says, take my yoke and learn of me. Folk who aren't learning of Christ, and they're not learning of him if they're not following him. Folk who aren't learning of him, they might have come to him. A lot of people come to Jesus. You got to take his yoke. You got to give him your burdens. You got to give him all the weights. And the only place he takes them is not in our imagination. It's at the cross. Hallelujah. It's at the cross. He don't take them nowhere else. He don't take them in our, just our imagination. He, he took all our burdens and all our weights. He destroyed malice and guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speaking. He destroyed all of that, delivered, all of that, delivered us from all of that at Calvary. That's why we've got to moment by moment walk with our faith there. Because if our faith is not there, then the residue of that old man that was put away is going to get stronger and stronger. What do you think the residue of the old man is? The clinging vines of the fall, we've heard say it. The residue, the behavior, the conversation of the old man. It's these things. It's malice and guile and hypocrisies. That's why when Peter, in Galatians 2, stepped into a boat of hypocrisy, the apostle Paul didn't say, oh, you need to get filled with the Holy Ghost again. Uh, or, 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 you know, uh, man, he said, don't you know we're not justified by the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He took him back to where justification and and. and where, where what Peter needed in that moment, where it comes from, where he was justified. And the problem with Peter wasn't that he wasn't justified. It, that it was that he all of a sudden got caught off guard in a moment and he was found in a boat of hypocrisy. It can happen in a moment. But what he needed, the Lord gave him through Paul, which was a reminder of his position. Him being justified. Peter was justified. He didn't lose his justification before God because he committed a sin of hypocrisy. What happened was he, 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 he lost his way. He, he got out of the way in which fruit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit can be bare because it can't if we don't go back to Calvary. What do you think returning to our first love is all about? And do we actually think that we go back to our first love and just keep... Well, okay, I went back to my first love. Now, now I'm free to go. I got. I went back, got me a touch, and that. Now, that's what a lot of Pentecostal church, and I be Pentecost, but that's what Pentecost has come to: going to church and getting some kind of touch, and like the like like plugging in the, the like a some electric something, and going back out and, and 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 doing my thing all week. But I go back Sunday and get a touch again. I'm, no, no, my friend, moment by moment. If you ain't got going on outside inside the church what you think you got going on inside the church you what you got going on inside the church uh, it ain't nothing it's equal to what you got going on outside the church you need to remember that a lot of folk go to church and have a big showing but the show's over by the time they get in their car my friend this thing called christianity is step by step moment by moment and when you're not trusting in Christ and him crucified the place Place where you were justified and positioned in him, the place where all the power of God comes from, then everything else you're doing is all self-centered. Everything that's not Christ and the cross-centered is self-centered. Don't forget that. Now let's look at some of these things. Malice, you look it up on your own, I hope you would, but it means a uh, trouble, trouble, like stirring up stuff, you know. Uh, I, I call it spite. It's also a naughtiness, be, being naughty. Not, not some sexual perversion naughty, but, but, but tr trouble naughty. I call it spite. You know, people just do things out of spite. They, they, they'll hear something in a message that convicted them of sin, and they'll leave church and get on Facebook and just post something that's really, I hope they, I hope they know what I'm saying here. You know what I mean? Just that spiteful thing, just that, that malice. The Bible says put that away. 
You can't put it away. You ain't got no power to put it away unless it's that power you received and that you'll continue to receive through the moment you accepted Christ. You believed upon him. You received him through faith in his death and he gave you the power to be found becoming the children of God. John 1 and 12. Hallelujah. Hope you're taking notes today. So first of all, we're told to put away malice, which is troublesome thing. Trouble. When you hear things coming out of people's mouths that's causing trouble, that you, you see what's happening, you got to put that away. You got to put that away. Some, it's, because it's naughty. It's wrong. And the second thing mentioned here is guile. And that means like these wiles, the wiles, these schemes, these devices, these things that are deceitful. Anything that's not faith in the sacrifice is deceitful. And you say, well, no, I have faith in the cross, but also have faith. No, you don't separate the written word of God from the living word of God and the Lamb of God. You don't separate those. If you do, you're under a mirage and a deceitful deception. If you're not seeing Jesus in the scriptures and what he did at Calvary, then you're not seeing what the Holy Spirit's pointing you to. You're not being led by the Holy Spirit. People disagree with this all the time, but it's, it's because self is the most deceitful thing there is. That's right. The Bible says that the heart, Jeremiah prophesied this under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, that the heart is deceit, well, despitefully wicked or something like that. Above all things, above all things, above all things, the heart is desperately wicked. Above all, let's turn over and look at this morning since it ain't flowing out of my mouth. I think it's Jeremiah 17, 9. If I've got this right, yeah, the heart is deceitful above all things. That means even the devil. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. That means incurably sick. The heart is incurably sick. That's why God had to give us a new one. The old one is incurable. It's uncurable. It, it's, listen, it's deceitful above all things. It's uncurable. It's desperately wicked. And who can know it? I want you to get that today because it's out of the heart that the issues of our life come. That's why the Lord tells us, guard your heart with all diligence. All diligence for out of it <clears throat> come the issues of your life. So also guile. And guile, as we said, is devices, wiles, and deceitfulness. We're to, lay, we're, we're, we're to lay aside these things. Hypocrisies. This means acting under a feigned, a distorted part. Act, trying to, we're, we're acting a way that's not Christian. We're acting a way, believing a way, teaching a way, maybe not with our lips, but how we're living, as Peter did. Peter didn't say a word. It's not recorded that he did. He just got up and got away from the Gentiles when he heard those from James' church was coming, the church in Jerusalem. He got up and got away. He stepped into a, he started playing another part he started playing another part. See, the hypocrite is not just what we've said for years. That, well, it's the deacon in the bar on Saturday night, and then he's the deacon on Sunday morning at church. Listen, the hypocrite is any Christian who's not living, walking in the liberty that Christ afforded them at Calvary with the excuse that it's okay. Because that's saying, see, this is the deceitfulness of the heart that's so deceitful above everything that we can actually walk in a place where we believe it's okay to sin. It's not okay to sin. And everything not of faith is sin, the Bible says. So every, th every moment we're not trusting in Christ and Him crucified, 
These things are at work in our hearts, in our lives, the, whether, whether we're aware of it or not. And that's why we get caught off guard. We get tripped up and we stumble and we fall. Yeah, we're righteous in Christ. And if we look back to Calvary, we'll get up again. We can get up again. The righteous fall seven times, the Bible says, and gets up every time. But it's only because we can look back to see where our righteousness was afforded. Hallelujah. Where we became just in God's eyes and we get back up. But while we're not trusted in that, these things, they're going to happen they're going to happen. I didn't say they might happen. They're going to happen, even if they're happening in some deceitful, unknown, unaware, deceptive manner. They're going to happen because there is no escape from them without the cross. Temper tantrums. Christians blowing up, knocking holes in the wall. Hey, get, why, where do you th what in the world do you think Christian men and women end up in divorce? I can say this, if there's a Christian husband and a Christian wife and they end up in divorce, it emphatically means they either both weren't trusting in the sacrifice or one of them wasn't. Because if both were, they don't get divorced. And I'm not talking about they, we just don't get divorced. That's, no, they find the power of of God through the cross to forgive and to love and to find the way through everything that comes to cause them to stumble. It's in these times that we're not trusting or we don't know to trust. Either one's ignorance and both have a serious repercussion. And we need to, we need to start living this life we claim we have. Life really has no breaks. The physical life you have, man, that heart's been beating ever since you've been born. You've been breathing air ever since you've been born, however many years that is. It's, it, there's been no break in that, and it's supposed to be the same way in the spirit. There are, shouldn't be no breaks in our following, in our trusting, in our surrender, in our union, in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what the Lord is saying today. This is where the Lord is pointing. This is what the Lord has always been saying. It's what he's always been trying to do, and there there will always somewhere be a few that long to please God, not just say they do, long to be in fellowship with God, not just say they do. They're, they will show it by striving moment by moment for the faith of the gospel, the faith, the power, the life that comes through the gospel moment by moment. The Bible says that a part of hypocrisy, one of the definitions of hypocrisy is condemnation. What do you think the statement was, though Peter might not have opened his mouth when he got up and got away from the Gentiles that he'd been sitting there sucking the chicken juice off the leg bones there with them, enjoying his freedom and liberty in Christ Jesus with the Gentiles. But when he heard some from James's church was coming, he got up and got away from them, didn't want to be seen with them. What do you think that said? Because our actions speak. A part of hypocrisy is condemnation. He was condemning them while he accepted those from James' church. Because you don't, you can't hold both. You can't hold in one hand those who say you still got to do this on this day and you still got to do this to your flesh and you still, and, and, and then over here, you, you're teaching them that you, you don't have to do all the things you, I mean, now, and I'm, you, it's confusion. It's confusion. It's like men who say one day Christ works exclusively within the perimeters of one's faith in the cross, and then the next day we show up and we say, well, he, he can do very little. No, it's one or the other. That's confusing. It's confusing. 
And God is not the author of confusion. This is why we must be determined to get all the way in on the truth of the gospel, the message of the cross. There's no room for nothing else in our lives, in our marriages, raising our children, in our ministries, other than Christ and Him crucified. God can bring all the rest of everything that's needed through our simple childlike faith, the simplicity of Christ, our faith in his sacrifice. So anytime we're playing the part of a hypocrite, there's condemnation in that. Because we're playing a role, and the role that we're not playing, that we should be playing, there's condemnation toward that. Remember what Jesus taught. That whichever way we're clinging to, the way of the world, which is mammon, that ain't just money, that, that's all the world, mammon, or we're serving God. While we love one, we, you can't just dabble in the other. While you love one, you hate the other. Or while you're clinging to one, he said, you'll despise the other. And Peter had a show of despising the Gentiles who had been enjoying the liberty and freedom of Christ with, but when he heard certain, certain men were coming, fear gripped his heart. The fear of man will snare you and entrap you, the Bible says in Proverbs. The fear of man is a snare because you can't have both. You're clinging to one, and whichever way you're clinging to, you're despising the other. That's why, that's why men come along and say, oh, they've made a law out of preaching the cross. They, 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 they think they've got to say the cross all the time. They say, because there's, there's a despising there. They don't know it. It's deceitful. It's deceptive. Itself just screams with everything it's got because he don't want to give it. He don't want you giving yourself wholeheartedly over to the way of the gospel, the way of the death of Jesus. So there was some condemnation there as Peter reached out and grabbed a hold of the Jewish whatever, those men whatever, and there's condemnation toward the other. There's a despising toward the other because whatever you're getting away from, you're despising it. And the only thing you ought to be despising is the sin. These things, malice and guile and hypocrisies and envies. And the only way you can truly despise those things is if you're clinging to Calvary. But if you're not clinging to Calvary and you're clinging rather to these things, you're... There's a despising there. There's a despising there of Calvary. Is the cross only good enough to get me into heaven and to deliver me from an eternal lake of fire? Or is the cross of Christ, is the Lamb worthy? Is the Lamb of God worthy for every moment of my journey? That's the real question, isn't it? Is He worthy? of all my thoughts today, or at least my striving to keep my mind stayed on him. Is he worthy of that? So let's move on now. Here's another one, envies. These things we told to lay aside, envies, which is jealousy with ill manner. You know, we we make jokes. Well, I'm jealous of I'm jealous of you, man. I wish I had one of them. But 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 envy, envy. The Bible says wherever there's envy and strife, James wrote it. There's every manner of evil. Every evil work is found there. Wherever there's evil and strife, every evil work comes in through that. You don't. You've come too late to tell me I don't need to know how to lay these things aside because if I don't, 
Every, that's why I can't get over the hump, so to speak. That's why I can't stop doing all these big pieces of stupid. That's why I just keep going around the mountain. That's why I just stay stuck. That's why I do a big piece of stupid. And I, well, thank you. I know you love me, Lord, and you know I love you. And, and, and I'm just going to talk myself right through this. And, and I think I'm, th but the Holy Spirit never had an opportunity to deal with what's there. And you better mark it down, my friend. It didn't go away. It, it's right there. You're going to step in that mud puddle of dumb again. I guarantee it, it without a doubt unless you know the process of laying these things aside. They hadn't been laid aside. You just thought you, thought you could talk yourself through it. Confessing all the things that are right. That you love God. That he loves you. That he's merciful and gracious. And that he saved you some years back. But what about right now? What about every time these things come up before you? That you, 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 you seem to always be moved by them in the wrong direction. It's because... Moment by moment, you're called a good soldier. A so good soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ. A good soldier doesn't go out on the battlefield. And my friend, you're in the battlefield 24-7. A good soldier doesn't go out on the battlefield not being prepared, armed, and ready at all times and aware of what's going on around him. Hallelujah. So envies, to envy is to have jealousy with ill will. You know, I, I wish they'd die so I'd get that. Folk, folks sitting around on people, waiting on people to die so they could, I mean, God ain't waiting on nobody to die for you to be, God, people waiting on people to die. So, well, I, I got this all planned out. When they die, this is this is what I'm going to do. When they no. no God's already got it planned out, and I promise you, whatever you got planned is not good planning. It's not good planning. It's, it's, it, it, never, it never will work that way. So watch this now, and here's the last one, and all evil speaking. And all evil speaking. That means anything spoken... Listen to this, Colossians chapter 4, verse 6. Let your speech be always with grace. How can that be? <laughs> if I'm following the Holy Spirit's leading, where is he leading me? To Calvary. 2 Corinthians 4.11, I hope you've written it down. And I hope you understand that the death Paul was writing about there that the Holy Spirit always turns him over to was not just situations in his life where men wanted to kill him. No, the Holy Spirit turns us over to death always so that we might express the life of Christ always. If you go that other route... You're going to stay in your boat load of dumb. You're going to keep getting caught off guard. We all are going to do that at times, but you just in this cycle. Ain't no need to be in no cycle, my friend. We should be growing, processing in this progress of sanctification. We should be learning and growing. The yoke of Christ brings about a, a learning, and a learning brings about the experience, and experience brings about fruit, hope, hallelujah, glow, greater things of our God. Hallelujah. So watch this. Colossians chapter 4 verse 6. Let your speech be always with grace. That means with what God's stirring you to say because that's what grace is. Grace is what God does. God says God, God saved you. We're saved by grace. He saved you at the cross. God teaches you Holy Spirit, who is God, does the teaching. We labor by grace. We labor by the power of the Holy Spirit, who is God. Everything that we call grace is something God is doing. So let's read this again. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Every man. Think about that. Now, it's also interesting that right now, last 
Thursday, I began to move into Hebrews chapter 12 on our Monday and Thursday morning teachings. And yesterday, we actually dove into the first verse of chapter 12 in Hebrews and watch what it says and look at the similarity of what the Holy Spirit's trying to get us to see through what he says to us in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 and what he's saying here in verse 1 of chapter 2 that Peter wrote of, of First Peter about laying aside, watch, Hebrews 12 and 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. The weights are here mentioned that Peter, as Peter wrote about them, some of them. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin. That's the sin nature. That's the noun. That's the same word that's used 15 out of the 16 times sin is used in Romans chapter 6 as the noun, the sin nature, and the sin which does so easily beset us, so easily catches us off guard, so easily catches us off guard. And let us run the race with patience, the race that is set before us. So I wanted to bring those things to our attention today because it's not just a coincidence the Lord has us right where we are in Hebrews chapter 12 and right where we are in 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 1 today being told to lay aside all malice, all guile, and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings. The word all is used. That means all the moments of my life, every day, I'm supposed to be on guard. And if there's anything there, I've got to bring it to Calvary. Where is it at? It's in my mind. It, it's in my thoughts. And the Bible says I'm to take every thought captive. I'm to bring every thought captive to the obedience of of Christ. That means the obedience of his death. Obedience unto death. Because the cross is where all these things were crucified. And the cross, my faith there, is where the only time they can be laid aside. All this teaching about that I have some power now just to lay aside because I'm a Christian, that's true. But, but, but the, tr the real truth is I got to learn from where the power comes from. And if I don't know, then these things are going to just be a regular part of my life in a deceitful, deceptive manner. And I'm going to make excuses. Well, nobody's perfect. Well, we're not going to be like Christ till we get to heaven. That, those are true statements. But what they are are statements used by the millions of Christians today who either don't know to surrender their heart every moment of their life to the work of Christ in his death on Calvary's cross, or they do know it, they have heard it, and they're choosing not to. Because only as we deny self through the taking up of our cross are we allowing Christ to rule over us and our worship to be in spirit and truth or, or self is in control. Self is ruling. Self. And I can cry tears and sing praise and worship songs with my hands in the air. I can lay on the carpet and stain it with tears and self be deceiving me because the cross of Christ as an active it has an active place in my moment by moment living these things we must know and when we say well I don't need to know all that I just love Jesus you can say I love Jesus till the cows come home my friend but that don't mean you're obeying the word of the Lord. And if you're not obeying the commands of Jesus Christ, the word of the Lord, if you're not walking in obedience to what he said, he said you don't love him. You did love him 
While we are not obeying him, there is no expression of love to him. And you can't say, well, we, we became obedient, brother, when we trusted in the cross. That's, a, that's the truth. We became obedient to God when we trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ because it's his obedience that was afforded unto us as our obedience. But that's our position. That's our position. What about your condition? What about your condition? What about the expression of our position in our moment-by-moment condition? Where is it? Well, brother, no, 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 that's self. Self is trying to get you to shut up, man. Don't be talking about the sacrifice of Christ so much. Because self, self is contrary. I'm talking about that thing in us that has nothing good about it. That fleshly, carnal, egotistical, prideful thing that wants to rule and reign. The behavior the conversation of the old man who still wants to rule and reign over the spirit. It's there, my friend, and it, it is reigning and ruling every Christian at every moment. They're not trusting in the cross of Christ. Romans 6, 16 says, who you going to serve? You ain't got but two choices. That's everybody on the planet. Christians get to make the choice. Lost people, they serve in the sin nature unto death. They're dead in their sins and, and buried in their trespasses. They, they, they're dead. Their soul is lost. Their spirit is dead. But when they're born again, Romans 6 teaches that you still got to choose to yield to the truth that gave you your position or you won't be able to serve God in righteousness, bearing forth the fruits of holiness. Because without holiness, can't no man see the Lord. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, I believe it's verse 14, tells us, without following after peace, which was made through the blood of the cross of Christ, and holiness, which is the fruit of who you became in Christ, righteousness, can't, can't no man see the Lord. Mostly in the church today, mostly in the church today, men only see men. Men only hear men's wisdom. They're not hearing the testimony of the Lord. They're not hearing the testimony of God, which is men preaching Jesus Christ and Him crucified. For the most part, that's not what's being heard. That's not what's being taught. That's not the light the scriptures are being held in. And the wrath of God is being revealed against all the ungodliness and unrighteousness that is the fruit of all the moments in our lives that we're not trusting consciously. Consciously. How can you, how can you capture every thought and take it captive unto the obedience of Christ if you're not conscious of what's going on? It's a serious matter, my friend. The opportunity, since Christ came and gave his life, shed his blood, suffered on Calvary's cross, and died for us there. The, 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 the possibility is there, available now, for every child of God to literally walk with him moment by moment, not just have a, a, a religious time for two or three hours on Sunday morning, maybe an hour Bible study on Wednesday night, maybe a little 30-minute hour devotion in time of prayer every morning. It is all day long on the job, all day long in the classroom, all evening home with your spouse, hallelujah, learning to trust in the cross of Christ moment by moment because without trusting in the cross of Christ, they ain't nobody trusting in Christ. That right there, most preachers don't believe either. They said they've gone on from the cross. I've said it before. Many are saying it and still saying it and haven't stopped saying it. We've gone on from the cross Their lives are full of malice and guile and hypocrisy, envies and all evil speaking. Their lives, are, their hearts are full of it. Because without faith, exclusively, 
And this is a tangible thing, a heart surrender to the sacrifice of Christ, that this is not all about you. That's not your ministry. That's the ministry of the Lord. That's not your... This, you are not even your own child of God. Moment by moment, surrender to the death of Christ. Our union with him there is the only way that we're going to be able to lay aside all the weighty issues of this world and the sin that easily bewilders us, besets us, weighs us down, prevents us from running this race of victory with patience. We're not going to be able to lay these things down unless you take up. The only thing that causes everything else that's not godly to be put down, and that's the cross of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. It's been a great broadcast today. I hope you've been encouraged. I hope you've been enlightened. And I hope that you would just let the Bible be the word of God to you. Don't worry about what men say. Trust the word of God, for it is a sure word of prophecy to those who have ears to hear. God bless you, and we're here every Friday morning at 9 a.m. Central Time. And so join us for Cross Time with Pastor Curtis. Don't forget about the website, thecrosswaychurch.com. Click on the store icon and check out the products there. They're, for a, they're there to be a blessing for you. And if the Lord stirs your heart to give to this ministry, that's between you and him. You can do that at thecrosswaychurch.com or you can simply text the word GIVE to the number 903-231-5950. God bless you. I love you and I appreciate all you that support the ministry here. You surely are a part of the work of God here. I'll see you Sunday morning. God bless you. Until then, stay determined to know absolutely nothing but Christ and Him crucified. We'll see you then.